It is also uh, on the brink of college football season. And, of course, I, I work over at uh, Fox Sports for the last couple of seasons doing college football. Had the opportunity uh, to fill in for Rob Stone on Big Noon Kickoff this year. They do an outstanding job. Big Noon Kickoff is doing his thing right now with uh, Matt Leinart, Urban Meyer. Uh, now they got Mark Ingram in the mix and my man, Brady Quinn, who is a Notre Dame great, good guy, great father, great all-around person. He joins us right now on the Rich Eisen Show. What's up, Brady? How you doing, man? Good morning. I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me on, man. I was going to say that story you told about April Fool's, I thought you were calling up like an ex-girlfriend to kind of play like a joke on her, like you're getting back with her, and then you're saying, ah, ha, ha, dad, no chance. So went a little different direction than I thought you were going to take that one. Yeah, well, she's an ex now. She's an ex now. I don't, I don't, <laughs> loyalty means, like, come on, you got to at least go get some bail money. Go get, go into my bank account and get me some bail money. At least act like you're concerned about me being in jail or whatever. Of course, your wife would never do that to you, Brady, of course, right? You, you, but you would never be in trouble no, anyway. No, it, my, my wife would leave me in there because she'd be like, <laughs> yeah, whatever you did, you probably deserve it. So you can go ahead and hang out for a while and. I'll come. I'll come pick you up when you're ready. Look at that all American face. Look at that, Brady. You wouldn't survive in jail. I'm just saying, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Brady, Brady. Oh boy, the, never go to jail, Brady. Never go to jail. I'll just yes. say that. All right. Uh, it's almost college football season, man. Uh, of course, uh, big noon kickoff is going to have a, a great slate of games. Once again, you guys going to be on a roll. What, what What are the weeks leading up to college football like for you, though? Um, I mean, I think I think right now, I mean, for me, it's. It, the unofficial start is actually always the media days, which the Big Ten just wrapped up uh, here the past few days. Um, but you, you really get a sense for what you know what the perception is of the conference, of the players, the coaches, how you think things are going to go, and then the games are played, and, and you get to see the reality of it. And I think you know there's always things that stand out. You know, for example, I just came back from the Big Ten media days, and you know you get Michigan, which you know, has won the past two years. Mm -hmm. They beat Ohio State the past two years, you know, birthed into the college football playoff, yet they weren't the betting favorites. You know, they're tied with Ohio State. I mean, I'd take that as a sign of disrespect, especially when you take into account Ohio State's got to break in a new quarterback. Really talented group, but, you know, they've had a hard time beating that team up north now for four years. People tend to forget they didn't play during the COVID year uh, and then the past two Michigans won. So it's been a while. And uh, if, if you're Michigan, like a little disrespectful, and obviously there's news about Jim Harbaugh and uh, some violations there, so he's going to miss the first four games of the season. Um, but, you know, things like that kind of stand out. And, and you have to remember, too, like last year, if you go to the Big 12, TCU was, I think, voted to finish seventh, mm-hmm. and they ended up playing for the national championship. So you, you can't always buy into – necessarily what the media thinks because there's always going to be some fun storylines once the season starts. Yeah, you know, the media don't know what the hell we're talking about sometimes. We just kind of guess out there, man. But yeah, like you was mentioning, man, I think it's really disrespectful for Michigan, especially after they rolled Ohio State at Ohio State last year and bringing back uh, uh, Blake Corum, uh, J.J. McCarthy. But you did mention uh, Jim Harbaugh facing that four-game suspension for uh, basically kind of lying to the man or not giving up all the information that the man wanted. And the man is the NCAA. How do you think that's going to affect the team early on, even though the schedule doesn't seem like they have a, a, a tough matchup in those first four games. Yeah, they've got three soft non-conference games. No disrespect to those teams they play, but Michigan's on a different level right now. Then they have to play Rutgers Big Ten play, which Greg Schiano has helped make that team more competitive, but they're not quite there yet. So if you're going to miss four games in the season, these are the four to miss. And actually, you know, the suspension allows Jim Harbaugh to be there all week. He just can't be there during game day. Mm-hmm. And I think if you had a young team that was inexperienced or maybe breaking a new quarterback, that would be a concern. But that's not the case with this group, right? J.J. McCarthy returns. You mentioned Blake Corum. Edwards obviously in the backfield. You know, their offensive line won the Joe Moore Award again for the best offensive line in college football. They're all back. 7-11 starters on defense, led by Junior Colson. So, this is a very experienced upperclassman group. And, you know, as far as the staff goes, too, that's intact as well. Not, not a lot of sweeping changes there. So they're prepared to basically handle this. And I actually think this could be one of those things that's like a galvanizing opportunity for the players to kind of rally around one another and, and, and take over control and really responsibility for this team for this year. And, and in the locker room without Jim Harbaugh being there on game day. Yeah, and Corum kind of alluded to uh, that that it might rally the team and bring them a little bit closer together without their coach being there. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure Big Noon kickoff is going to have a lot of uh, 
uh, games uh, featuring Michigan. Uh, of course, the Michigan-Ohio State game is always a big game. Uh, look, man, look, I'm going to tell you right now, I've been doing this for 28 years, and being on the road with you guys, that was maybe top five of the most fun I've ever had uh, being a part of any type of coverage, man. You guys have a, a, a great crew. You do a great job over there, man. How fun is it for you? Oh, it's awesome. I mean, I think, look, I love the game of football. I've been so blessed to be able to play it for starters and and the places that I've been, the people that I've met through it, and then just the fact of being able to cover it, it, it's fun. And I think what we try to do or attempt to do is basically have a party and celebrate the game, celebrate the players, their stories, the coaches, and everything around it. I mean, that's really the goal of it. You know, you think about tailgating. I mean, call what you want. It's just a party before the game, right? And it's a party hopefully after the game if things go well. Uh, if your team wins. And, and that's really what we're looking to do is, is try to bring everyone in and be a part of the party along with telling those stories and trying to educate some people on some football and, and have some fun. So it, it's, it's been a blast. Um, you know, we, we, we get the chance to kind of branch out, see different campuses. I always tell people, I'm like, I, I don't know why people don't ask more like, hey, my kids are looking at going to school. Like, what do you think? Because, like, we go everywhere. Like, yep. we see these campuses. Like, we've got in-depth knowledge at this point of, like, Hey, like I've got young kids, so they're not there yet, but I can tell you like my opinions on different places where the kids should be going to school. Cause there's some, there's some wonderful places out there and there's some places you're kind of like, Oh, you might want to be, I want to be aware of this. If you're going to go there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. And you guys have a great time once again, and I'm looking forward to the coverage again this season, Mark Ingram uh, stepping into the mix as well this year. Speaking of going somewhere, Notre Dame, see where they go. Uh, second season under Marcus Freeman, uh, got off to that slow start last year. Oh, and two did finish strong, uh, added Sam Hartman. Now he's running the show, coming over from Wake Forest. What's your expectations for your Irish this year? Yeah, well, well, anytime you've got a guy who's, I think, what the all-time, you know, leading passer in ACC history coming in for a sixth year, you've got high aspirations at Notre Dame. And Sam is a very mature, uh, very productive, smart player, tough player. That always was the thing that stood out to me watching him on tape uh, is, is he'll stand in that pocket and he'll deliver a throw and he'll take a shot after doing it. So um, he's very well you know, suited to take over a role where he's going to be on a national prominence, and especially with their schedule, right? you got to play USC, OSU, and Clemson this year. Those are three big dogs. I mean, all three of those teams, you could make the case, could be top ten at a minimum, if not maybe all top five, depending on how the season plays out. And, that, and that's not to mention, you know, the rest of their schedule, which won't be easy either. So, um, you know, having him gives you a huge shot at doing that. Their offensive line, it's a bunch of future NFL players. So, yeah, they're going to be able to run the football. Audrick Estime is one of the best running backs mm-hmm. uh, in the country. He's already solidified himself as that. It just really comes down to who's going to step up on the outside a uh, young man by the name of Tobias Merriweather. Keep an, keep an eye out for him, big number five. He's going to be a big-time playmaker, I think. And defensively, it's just continuing to kind of build on, you know, what Marcus started as the defensive coordinator now as a head coach. Um, and then Al Golden calling the defense there as the D.C. They've done a tremendous job uh, of really being that stable piece. Uh, but now we got to have some some stars emerge. Isaiah Foskey, I drafted the Saints. He's no longer there. Uh, Kyle Hamilton was a couple years ago. We've seen his impact with the Baltimore Ravens. You know, we've got to have some of those leaders step up and emerge, and that's going to be the biggest thing. So uh, there's always high aspirations when you're playing for Notre Dame, right? Like you go to these media days, and you're like, Man, I don't know what these things were like because we didn't have, have them as a player. Right. You talk to players and coaches, their goal is to win the conference. At Notre Dame, you're just trying to get in that playoff and trying to win a national championship. Yeah, you're going to find out a lot about uh, Notre Dame, as you mentioned earlier on, Ohio State on September 23rd. They did play them close last year. A lot of people don't remember that. Uh, USC on October 14th. Of course, USC high expectations this year. Probably going to be a top – should be a top five preseason pick. Caleb Williams coming back. Have they added enough defensively, in your opinion, though, to take that next step and get into the college football playoffs? For Southern Cal? Can you say it? I mean, I know it's I know it's USC. (laughs) Can you can you actually say something nice about USC? (laughs) I like I like saying Southern Cal because it really upsets the uh, the Trojan fan base for some reason. I'm not sure why. I mean, that's that's the name of your school, but they get really upset by it. And I always try to explain them. I'm like, you know, USC on the East Coast is South Carolina, right? Like that's that's how people refer to them as. So, um, no, I, I think. I think Caleb Williams gives you always a legitimate shot at winning a national championship because he's the best quarterback in college football. Um, there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He'll be the number one draft pick in next year's draft. To me, he's one of the most unique talents I've ever seen at the position. Uh, and so even despite their defense, which people tend to forget, you know, that defense actually helped bail them out in some games early last year. Mm-hmm. They had a ridiculous turnover differential 
And then they didn't have any much depth. And I think as they got worn down as the season wore on, that's where you saw – uh, some of the issues defensively that they were having. But they added seven transfers on defense alone. They've really tried to shore up the front seven, not only to stop the run, but I think to add some pressure too. So they feel much better about it. You know, Do they have the depth they'd like to have? They're probably another year away from that. Uh, but I think defensively they, they will be improved. I, I think the only thing you have to ask yourself is, you know, are they going to be able to generate as many turnovers as they did last mm-hmm. year? Yeah. That was kind of an anomaly. And they, they played to their benefit. So – as, as much as we're like, hey, they're they're a, you know, an improved defense away from playing in the college football playoffs for a national championship, there's also a side of me that's like, well, a lot of those turnovers that they got and some of the points early, some of that's not going to be there for them this year just because it's hard to do that. I think they were like plus 22 in the turnover yeah, yep. differential. They so, were very opportunistic, you know, very opportunistic yeah, last year. And, and so I kind of look at it and just say they're definitely going to be in the hunt. But I don't know that the Pac-12 has been this strong top to bottom mm. in the past five years. Okay. Like, I don't care what team you're talking about. Even, like, Arizona. Jed Fish has done an unbelievable job building up that program. Jay Deloria can sling that football around. They'll put pressure on surprise people. You can go up to Washington State and Cam Ward. That kid's a stud. Yep. You know, they have as good of competition as anyone. So, I think, can they, can they get over the hump of Utah, who beat him twice? Mm. Cam Rise is like my favorite quarterback in college football that – no one talks about enough. He's going to have a legit NFL future, too. Uh, coming off a, a torn ACL, but he should be ready for the season when it starts. And you know how good you know, um, you know, Kyle Whittingham is. So it, it's just it's a tough conference, I think, to survive through. I think they, they could be beating themselves up uh, when it's all said and done. Yeah, and they got Washington, Oregon up there. Oregon State's going to have another good team up there as well. Talking to Brady Quinn, uh, Fox College Football Analyst, right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, speaking of USC, Notre Dame, high expectations coming into this year. Once again, Notre Dame had high expectations last year, faltered. Texas A&M, high expectations, top 10 in the preseason, faltered. Is there a team that you're looking at right now that may be in the top 10? that may be a little bit overhyped that you might see falling. And then on the back end of that, give me this year's TCU. Oh, man. it's uh, Well, first off, I, I really don't pay too much attention to preseason rankings because I, I, I think it's always a bit odd. Mm-hmm. And, and when you go back and you look at the impact that preseason rankings sometimes can have, especially early on, mm-hmm. because it's all from the AP, and it influences, I think, to a degree, the college football playoff committee. And it's a bit unfair because you get four or five games in the season, you see what some of these teams are, and you're like, dude, that, that really wasn't a ranked win or it shouldn't be factored in that way. So I agree. Um, I, I, I think – I'll put it this way. I, I think the team that there's the most optimism about that really needs to take a big next step is Texas. Mm. It's their last year in the Big 12 – uh, I, I think Steve Sarkeesian has done a tremendous job with the offense, however, defensively. And last year they, they showed some improvement there once they brought along, you know, Gary Patterson to be a part of that group. But, um, you know, they, they kind of started then to fall off offensively the second half of last year, especially for some of the games that Quinn Ewers was, wasn't there for. Um, that, that's the team that I think I'm looking at and most curious about. You yeah. know, can they be – the Big 12 thinks they're going to win the Big 12 this year. They think they could be in, in college football playoff contention. Um, they've got to replace B. John Robinson, but they do have a deep backfield. They've, they've recruited well. They have a ton of speed and talent on the outside, a wide receiver, maybe the best tight end in the Big 12. And Ewers could be that other name we're talking about when it's all said and done with Caleb Williams, with Drake Mann, a North Carolina quarterback, for being that, that you know top 10 pick because he's got the ability. And I think he's matured a lot. I think he's taking, you know, he has taken the offseason uh, very different than how he did in the past. So, uh, Texas is the team that I think I'm just, I guess I'll put it this way, I'm most curious about. I think, you know, that could be a team that either takes off and dominates and wins the Big 12, is in the playoff, or it could be one where, you know, it, it, it doesn't work out quite as well. And who knows, you know, what we're, how we're talking about Texas after at the end of the season. Um, and as far as like a surprise team that I, I don't know, I don't think it's, people are talking about enough um, for national consideration. I don't know if this is a sleeper as much, but like Penn State yeah. is, is like the third favorite to win the Big Ten. Mm-hmm. I think this team could break out and be a playoff team. Wow. Like Drew, Drew Aller reminds me, their quarterback reminds me of Big Ben. He's gigantic, Mike, and wow. he can move. He's got a howitzer for an arm. He's polished. They've got two backs in the backfield that are studs in Katron Allen and Nick Singleton. Uh, their left tackle might be the best left tackle, Olu Fashanu, in, in, in college football. Chop Robinson's like their next great edge rusher. 
Abdul Carter looks like a young LeVar Arrington. Kalen King's a stud in their secondary. Like, they're loaded. Wow. And some would say if not now, then when. But that's one of those teams that I think – I don't know that people look at them on the national stage as, like, being a part of it. That's another team that if things go well this year, they could be the Big Ten champ. They could be playing for a national championship. Well, they got to get over two big humps, of course, Ohio State and Michigan, just like they uh, they lost to them last year as well. So we'll see if Penn State uh, can get that job done. Brady, before we let you go, man, I know you got a great foundation. You're just an all-around great guy. Tell us about it, man. Yeah, the Third and Goal Foundation, uh, it's, it's been up and running for about 13 years now. We, we help wounded veterans. Uh, we remodel mm-hmm. homes, make them handicap accessible for wounded vets. We put on educational platforms to help them start, continue, or finish their education. And lastly, we would just provide uh, help for military families in need. So uh, 3ng.com is the website. Um, you can kind of find out more about different events and ways you can help. But uh, always appreciative of our veterans, appreciative of you, Mike. I know you have served. My father served. So thank you. Uh, thank you out there to all the veterans that have served to protect this country. Love you, brother, man. Thank you so much, man. Best of luck this season. I know I'll be seeing you around. Yes, sir. Sounds good. Love you, Mike. See you, brother. All right. Brady Quinn joined us here on the uh, Rich Eisen Show. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free. 